קצר, לשלב את בלסינג, ברוך אתה ה' אלוהינו מלך העולם, ה' נותן התורה. אמן. Basically, you Lord God, King of the universe, who gives the Torah of truth and the good news of salvation to his people Israel and to all the peoples through his son Yeshua the Messiah, our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to do something. We're going to do things a little bit backwards today. Um, the kiddies are coming from downstairs up to when we start exploring the al -Khet. Okay? I trust that you guys have been going through that prayer. Yes. And everybody's feeling all warm and squishy inside and they realize they're all perfect. Mm -hmm. Not going to be close, right? Okay, yeah, good. We're going to go through it and then we just, you know, as we'll, we'll just maybe highlight certain things and say, okay, look, this is maybe something that you need to think of. This is something that you need to go through. This is something that needs to go on. But before we get there, we need to discuss tabernacles. All right? As we are coming in, we've just been through Rosh Hashanah, Yom Tiro, right? Next 10, we're in the 10 days of awe, deal with Yom Kippur, and then from Yom Kippur, Sukkot. Okay? So let's focus on support and let's get our foundations. You guys are all very, very clever, and you know exactly what this means, and what the stipulations are, and what they were thinking, and what New Testament references were flying around. Yes? Um, totally good. Grapes. <laughs> grapes. <laughs> there is a doubt. Alright, so open up your Bibles to Leviticus 23. This is where we find all of our... One, one major place where we find our instructions of you will celebrate this at this, at this time. Okay. Verse 33. Adonai said to Moshe, to Moses, tell the people of Israel, on the 15th day of the seventh month is a feast of Sukkot for seven days to Adonai. Okay? So it's a seven day cycle, or seven day feast, should I say. What is Sukkot? What is this? Tabernacle. A tabernacle. Alright? And what is a tabernacle? Does that mean we go and we build a tent with a menorah and an altar and that? A temporary dwelling, okay? A sukkah is just a temporary dwelling, okay? So this is the time where he wants to remember, wants us to remember for seven days a time of a temporary dwelling. On the first day there is to be a holy convocation, a Shabbat. You shall not do any kind of ordinary work. For seven days you are to bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. For seven days you make specific offerings. On the eighth day you are to have a holy convocation and bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. So you have two Shabbats in the cycle. The first day and the eighth day are days when we rest. Is this according to Moses or according to God? God. Okay. Reiterate. These are God's appointed times. These are His feasts. What does it tell, well, what does it do for you when you celebrate these things, when you take off those Shabbats? What do you say? You focus on God, not on the world. You focus on His times, His feasts. Everything is about family, family and doing those Shabbats. So right. you're totally putting away things of the world. Right, you're focusing on your relationship with God, you're focusing on your relationship, you're focusing because you want to be set apart, you want to be sanctified, you want to be holy. You choose to celebrate these things, okay? These are the designated times of Adonai that you are to proclaim as holy convocations. These are days that are set apart for Him. Your relationship with God is, well, let me put it to you this way. You get married, as we know, God has betrothed us, we are the bride of Christ, we spoke about the Ketubah and the Ten Commandments, right? And now you are betrothed to this loving God. Use a normal wedding analogy, how many of you think it's a good idea to celebrate your wedding anniversary? Okay, really? any, any sane man better nod their head. <laughs> okay? It's an important time. It's a time where you go, wow, look, we've made it. No? 
think it was last week. <laughs> yeah. It was, you know, we've been going for two years, three years, five years, ten years, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty. How many people can sit back and then they can go, remember the day, on this day, I chose you to be mine. Out of all the people in all the world, you. These are God's anniversary moments. These are His special times. <laughs> these are times where you can really go before Him and then go, these are the Shabbats of Adonai. Your gifts, all your vows and your voluntary offerings that you give to Adonai. This is about your relationship. By you choosing to follow these things, you are declaring not only for yourself, you are declaring to God that I love you and I'm yours. But also at the same time you're telling the world you are set apart because you belong to God. Verse 39, but on the, 50, on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered the produce of the land, you have deserved the festival of Adonai seven days. So Sukkot is not only about a temporary dwelling, holding a sukkah, but it's also about in gathering of a harvest. Okay, this is the time when all of the grains and things like that should be in. We use the major one that we can look at is grapes. But at the end of it all, all of our important crops and things like that are mainly in mother's time. So it becomes a time, they actually call it, it's a festival of rejoicing. It is one of the most joyous days in the entire biblical calendar. Why? Because of God's provision. And then he tells you, okay, look, I want you to, I want you to be, I want you to be reminded. Reminded about the time of the tabernacle. Carries on to say, you'll take, on the first day you're to take choice fruit, palm fronds, and thick branches, and river willows, and celebrate in the presence of Adonai your God seven days. You are to observe it as a feast to Adonai seven days in a year. It is a permanent regulation, generation after generation. Keep it in the seventh month. Not until Messiah comes, not until I change my mind. This is permanent regulation. Keep it in the seventh month. Again, I'll remind you, there is God's way and there's your way. Too many times have I heard people say, you know what? I'm all for God's instruction and it's fantastic and beautiful. I believe that we, should, we need a Sabbath, we, we need a day of rest. I believe in a, sh in a sabbatical principle. So, you know, one day a week you need to rest. That's not God's way. God says, you will do it on my day. And it will be a sign between you and me and the world that you belong to me. Okay, I've used it, I will continue to use it. Sign of a covenant that I belong to somebody, right? Get married. Oh, I love you. I do. Oh, no, no, no. I don't want to wear it on that finger. Let me stick it on my pinky. Because, you know, it's the same symbol. This is what it means, right? It's my promise to you. Why aren't you wearing it on the right finger? No, it just feels more comfortable on my pinky. What am I telling the world? Yeah, but I'm telling my wife. It's still my wedding band, isn't it? Uh, apparently your, your, wedding, your wedding finger in your left hand mm -hmm. actually has a vein that connects straight to your heart. It's the only thing in your body. In your Interesting. Straight to your heart. Alright, so it's about a heart condition. <laughs> but, Dave, this is my wedding day, right? I'm not, I'm not changing it. This is, this, is, this is about my promise to my wife. Yeah, it's a piece of jewelry. Yes, yes, yeah. So, I mean, I really don't like rings anyway, so... But I'm married. People, please, I'm married. Don't, 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 don't try and tell me I'm not. It's about my heart, right? 
too many times we try to adjust certain things and make it about something else and try to make ourselves conform not to God but to our own way of thinking, our own adjustment, our own whatever. And we forget about what he said. These are my holy conversations. These are my times. You will keep it. You will safeguard it. They will be holy days for you. Not make for yourself a holy day. That was never the instruction. So when we come to these feasts and things like that, people go, oh yes, Sabbath. Shabbat or whatever. Wrong button. What? Okay. When you go through this whole entire process, and then what happens is, you just ignore every single thing that you've got going on here, that you, that you take away from the Shabbats of God. When you talk about your Sabbaths, people think of only one day a week. But meanwhile, in Scripture, it talks about the Shabbat, the Sabbaths of God. And every single Shabbat tells you and tells the world who you belong to. So, so, just a quote, it's yeah. a feast of harvest. It's, it's a bad harvest, but there's something deep. It's temp temporary dwellings. It's, it's, there's, there's, a few, there's a few aspects. But, we're not, but the temporary dwelling is like we temporary dwelling on this earth. We're going to get there. You will observe it and you will keep a feast to Adonai seven days in a year, permanent regulation, generation after generation, keep it in the seventh month. Verse 42, you are to live in support for seven days. Every citizen of Israel is to live in a sukkah so that a generation after generation you will know that I made the people of Israel live in Sukkot. Remember that sukkah is plural. When I brought you out of the land of Egypt, I am Adonai your God. So he wants you to remember the time where he made them dwell in temporary dwellings. When was that? Came about 12, 40 years. Jacob, Mount Sunday, 40 years. Jacob also was in Timothy Dwellings first. Alright. Before um, Abraham. Yeah, Abraham also. So. He left Hebron, he left his city, he went up and he stayed. He was nomadic, he stayed in the tent. Mm -hmm. Isaac stayed in tents. Yaakov. And then the nations also dwelt in tents. What is that about? Now I want you to quickly go go to um, it really, really kickstarts only at the end of Exodus. So, Leviticus is more about. Do a quick scan through Leviticus and Numbers. Or if you want to do a, a, a quick sort of half check. Yeah, no, Leviticus and Numbers. Just do a quick scan and see with those who have the subheadings in their Bibles. See what sort of things God wants you to remember. Because uh, this, 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 I was sitting here thinking, you know what, I'm going to have a squiz. And I'm going to scan through what 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 about what what is there? What what do I pick up? Not a lot of people have subheadings in their Bibles on the side. <laughs> now what you find is have you guys got subheadings? I'll give you another minute. I see that. Instruction. See instruction. When you go through this thing, and it's a very weird thing, because when I start to, to go through this, and I thought, okay, you know what, God wants us to remember staying in tents, man. And we're going to go, we're going to look when Israel, when Israel stayed in tents. And you know what I found? Grumble, grumble, moan, moan, grumble, grumble, moan, moan, grumble, grumble, grumble. And I'm thinking, okay, why would God want me to remember that? Why would God want me to go through this whole process of remember the shortcomings of the people, remember the issues that they've had, remember the process that they had to go through? What is it about a sukkah? that isn't supposed to touch me here because all I'm thinking of is 
well, there's Hebrews number of what? And you know, that disturbs me because after going through the whole head, you realize you moan a lot as well. And you know, okay, but this is not a warm pick me up sort of thing. That's what's going on. What is so important about dwelling in a sukkah that God wants me to remember? How many of you stayed outside in a tent or have ever tried this before over, over seven days or five days or whatever? How many of you have been camping? All right, how many of you stay outside in a tent in the middle of the night, even if it's in the back garden? What do you hear? Do you feel all safe and secure in your house with your lock? You feel more safe in the outdoor because you tell yourself you're with God. Uh -huh. Something you never really never do. Oh, you're very special, you see, because the first thing you realize is that these walls are very thin and that zip that opens and closes, and I'm asleep. And I hope the dogs are around. And then, yeah, and if you're really camping, there's some serious spiders and snakes that I've got watch out and scorpions. Oh, and, you know, when we started doing this, I still set up my tent, I take it outside, and I put it in the back, and I sleep outside for seven days. And you sit there, and then you hear everything. And then a dog will walk past you, Hit the tent, you're like, what was that? It is the most <clears throat> nerve wracking in the beginning and yet so beautiful by the time you finish. And because, hmm? and it's rain, yes, it's good, it's rain, it's good. And you're sitting there and you realize that you're vulnerable. We come inside of our nice brick houses and you're like, yes, solid, solid. Hail! I'm not scared of hell. Oh, it's really melting outside. The cold, that's not a problem. I'm in my wife's warm duvet. I'm in my bed. Insulation, electricity. Comfort. And you get outside and you realize, man, oh man. That is the reality. You're sitting around and you build this fortress around yourself and we get tunnel vision. This is my life. You walk outside, sky, car. You get in your car, this is my car. <laughs> you run into your office, this is my office. This is my cubicle. You spend very little time outside. And you try to control these certain things that you're okay with because this is your cocoon. This is your shelter. This is where you belong. And God's going, remember the time when you were dwelling out in the vast open wilderness, flash floods. Animals, remember, lions and bears, David had to fight off. You want to, anybody want to go camping with me in the Kruger National Park? No. No? What was that? You hear a lion at like 400 yards, you're already climbing in your car. We are vulnerable. We are sitting in a place where we kind of delude ourselves to thinking you have control, you have your little space, and this is where you belong. When you go outside, and this is one of the most wonderful things about camping is, when you go outside, and, and this, the whole thing about building a sukkah, the guys will tell you that you need to see the stars. And when you look up to this vast expanse, <coughs> you feel this big. Scripture says, the heavens declare your glory. And in the midst of all this openness, I realize that my little tunnel vision, my little cocoon, is not where God dwells. He's there. He's so much bigger than my little house, my little office, my car, my issues, whatever. He's so much greater than all of this. But I put myself into this little bubble and then I tell myself, Oh, you know, God can't provide or I wonder if He loves me enough. And oh, we're going through the same because we forget to look up. If God, who called the stars out by name, who holds the entire universe in the palm of His hand, who gives us these massive planets that are on fire, with gravitational forces <coughs> and, you know, orbits and all the rest of it, that everything that, you know, if the earth was half a degree off, there would be no life. If He does that just to give you signs of the times, and He also gives it to you to declare His glory. And you're sitting there going, Well, I don't really know if He's going to answer me. <laughs> we need to get out. When we look back, Israel was 
the strongest they ever were when they were in that wilderness. As tough as it was, man, he taught them. He tested their heart. And most of all, he provided time after time, cloud by day. Judean wilderness, by 12 o'clock, it is 48 degrees. I was there, I know. By half past nine, I've got photos of the car thermometer driving back after snorkeling. Half past nine, it was 36. Please give me a cloud by day. Fire at night. People freeze to death in the wilderness. The Bedouin tents, the, these guys who still live, like in sukkahs, in temporary dwellings, in the wilderness, their tents are black. You're thinking, oh, you obviously lost your mind. Is it the cheapest fabric you can get hold of? They can deal with the heat. They worry about the cold. Please give me fire by night. Lord, where are you? Massive flame. I am the light of the world. I will go before you. I will cover you. Remember the time where I pulled you out and I brought you through the vast, tough wilderness. You go through this massive process and you learn to cling to God. How many of you have gone through really tight months, really difficult situations? How many of you have been pushed a little bit through a wilderness? And how many of you have learned to cling to God? And when you come out of that wilderness and you sit down and you drink from that living water and you all, you find an oasis and it keeps you going for, for a little while longer when you thought you couldn't anymore, He is that shelter. And we go through this process and He goes, you know what, I want you to remember, I want you to remember the time I was there for you. And I, you know, Scripture says, with, after the 40 years of wandering, it says their sandals did not wear, nor did their clothes, their ankles did not swell. 48 degree heat, flash floods, wild animals. And he's worried about my ankle swelling? He's worrying about my sandals? He's worrying about covering me? Where am I in tabernacles where I can sit down and I can remember this is one of the most awesome times in the world. Every great man of God spends time in the wilderness. Why? Because you shouldn't survive there. Perspective. Perspective. Because it's bigger than you ever imagined. It's harder than you ever thought. It was taking in there to testing, to know your heart, to build you up, to get you to the place so that you can rely on God and He can come through. Why? Because He wants to be real. He wants to be real to you. He wants you to understand Him. He wants you to love Him. He wants you to choose to walk with Him. Because with Him there is life. Or you can wander the wilderness by yourself and say, I'll follow you. People today are dropping like flies because they're trying to do things in their own strength. And what amazes me is God takes you through a wilderness and then He makes you an oasis. So that people, when they walk through and they need encouragement, they come up to you and you go, don't worry, God's got this. They get this sip of life-giving water and then they can take a few more steps. It amazes me that every great man of God goes and spends time. Moses, Elijah, Elisha, Yeshua himself spend time in the wilderness. And they're going through this this, this point of testing, this point of, do I really love my God? Can He really come through for me? Is He there with me? And time and time and time again, God answers that call. So when we look at going through Sukkot, and when we're building Sukkot, and you're staying outside, and I will encourage you, please try this at least one night. Get out of your cocoon. Go and spend time outside. Bride, instead of cook in the kitchen. Play outside at night, switch nights on, go sit outside in the quiet. And when there's no distraction, no TV, no sun, no cocoon, no, oh yes, it needs to be exactly quiet and exactly 16 degrees. 
And yes, my one foot needs to be up the blanket, and now I'm comfortable and I can rest. <laughs> Come out of that bubble and meet with God on His level. And you look up and you feel all of these things that He created. Just so that He can have that time with you. I promise you, the first couple of nights you, you, you set up your tent and then you're sitting over there and you're hearing sirens and dogs barking and you're listening you're like, this is really silly, I don't really believe I'm sleeping outside. And eventually you wake up, you know, because the sun wakes up at 5 o'clock in the morning, your tent goes, ding! What, what, Your alarm hasn't gone off and you look at your watch and you're like, you've got to be kidding me. I still got an hour because you can close your curtains in your house. And you hear the birds chirping and you have all of this. And you spend time in something that God has created and you sit there and you have quiet time with Him. I promise you, by the time you have to pack up that tent on the seventh day, you won't want to. Because for the first time in a long time, for many of us, I can leave the distraction, which is my house, and I can walk into a place and I can just be with Him. Where is my Mishkan? Where is my tabernacle with God? Where is yours? Go hide in your room in your little cocoon and you pretend to pay for, you, you pretend to listen out. I'm listening, listening, am I hearing you? Distraction, noise, psh, psh, get people getting dressed, showers going off, psh, psh, TV switching off, and screaming, Mommy, where's my gold ring? <laughs> where's that quiet? Where's that storm? Where's that communication? No, because the distraction is all around you. And you are so busy focusing on the 50 things you need to do as soon as you get up off that bed to go and pray. Or when you finish praying and then you're done and now, okay, look, I've got to get this done, I've got to get this done, oh my word, it's only 10 to. Okay, I need to get there, I need to get there, I need to skin that kid because it's being naughty and I have to do this and this. You've already forgotten about God. You haven't taken him with you to the day. When you talk about the times of when you go to the dwelling, he would go out before you. When he, when the Shekhinah descended on the tabernacle, they camped. When it lifted up, they packed up. When he moved, we moved. Are we doing the same? Or are you wandering through a wilderness going, I think you're going to do this. Maybe I think this is a good idea for me today. Oh, well, I just better focus on this because this is where I need to be. Are you focusing on God enough to realize when he says, move, you move? And I can tell you, many of those problems with the al is because we don't wait for Him to move. We move before He does. Mm -hmm. We create our own issues. We put our own stumbling blocks before God. We stick our fingers in His eye because we're too impatient to wait and focus on where He needs, to, needs us to be. He's not holding you back. He's preparing your future. If you jump into it before it's prepared, guess what? You're not going to have much of a future. Because you're going to struggle and you're going to panic it. And you're like, why is it so hard? Why, why, why is this not working out? Because we didn't wait on him. Did you sure walk up to John the Baptist? I mean, you're talking about two cousins. Hey, you, John, what are you talking about? I'm here, I'm here, don't listen to John. Or did he allow him to prepare the path? And when the time was right, he came in and John could say, you know that guy I was talking about, the one I've been talking to about, the one I said, get ready, he's coming. There he is. When God moves, we need to be ready to move with him. Where's your tabernacle? What are you focusing on? This time of ingathering. This time of, it's, it's nice, it's nice to see the transition. In the beginning you're like, oh, all the harvest is in, that means I'm going to have enough money to see me through for the next year. And when that doesn't happen, you kind of feel let down. But you said it was an ingathering harvest, what are you talking about? It's not just about the harvest, it was about to give you time. But to gather his people unto him because he was in the tabernacle. Are we not supposed to be harvesting now? Fishes of men? Gather them into the storehouse? Bring them to God? Where's your tabernacle? Or 
are you so concerned with your own ideas, your own life, your own timing, that we forget about God? And also a problem, guys, as much as we sit down and we don't focus on God enough, when He says move, we go, uh, I'll try that next week, okay. We're just waiting for things to calm down. And I can make funny voices because I've done this plenty myself, okay. I... Oh, no, I, I, I asked about it and I prayed about it and then you gave me an answer, but I don't like that answer. You know what you need to do. You know when God tells you to do what you need to do. So please, for your sake, for my sake, for God's sake, listen. Don't ask the king for a word and then don't listen to the word. If you wanted your own opinion, you could have done it yourself. Tabernacles is about perspective. It's about getting over yourself. It's about being vulnerable because it's good to be vulnerable with God. It's good to let everything go. My foundation, my structure, my car, my title, my money, my, 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 no God. And all of a sudden his tabernacle means nothing to me. If I, if we are the new temple of God, we nullify our space because it's all about us. We refuse to act and behave in the way that we're supposed to be acting and behaving in. Because we're so worried about our own perspective and our own fortifications and our own fortress. And you take that away from God. There's Barrows in the air. Are your hairs not all numbered? Seek ye first in the kingdom and its righteousness, and the rest will be given unto you. How many times does Yeshua have to remind us? Behold the lilies of the field. Are these verses ringing bells? Mm -hmm. No, 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 Lord. Just two minutes and then I need to go sort this out. I know you need to go sort that out. But your focus, your perspective, your heart should be in the tent of meeting. Should be about Him. Forget about this. Bricks, mortar, cement, that all passes. Man, when we go to Israel, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of piles of bricks. And I'm going to tell you stories, but that's pretty much it. Remember that story about Jah? That happened here. You see walls about this high. And you see foundations and you see an outline of something that used to be, but it's not there anymore. The big fuss made over the temple. I can show you the painting walls, I can't show you one stone that's on top there. You're so focused on foundations instead of understanding the heart. Wake up. Get outside. Make God your focus. Because whatever wilderness you have walked through, what you're going to walk through, what you are walking through now, the only way you're going to get through it is when you realize God is the one that's going to provide it. And He's not going to do it the way you want it. It's the way He plans it. Why? Because He's teaching you. He gave the Hebrews all the gold and the jewels and the gems in the world and He took them to a place where they couldn't use a cent of it. Drink that gold chain that you were pining after for the past 10 years. You can't. I want water. But if I could buy water, you know, I could buy like a whole field with water in it. Go out and buy it. Don't know where to go. Exactly. Sometimes our perspectives need to be adjusted to find out what's really, truly important. So that when we get into the places we need to be, we take the stuff that He's given us and we go, Baruch Hashem. This land that I'm standing on is because of you. Where I am is because of you. I have a roof over my head. I have four walls. I am standing in a place where I'm fairly solid. Because my foundation is in you, not in the stones. God knows how we operate. He knows how we think. We, one who say yes or yes, we know we've advanced. You know, the same mistakes these guys were making, I'm still making today. 5,000 years later, we didn't advance much, we just know a little bit more. 
But the same basics doesn't work. We need to get back to sukkah. We need to get our perspective back. We need to get back to the heart of God. A time when you can go, you know what? I can walk up to the tabernacle of God and I can go stand there in His presence. A reminder of Joshua. Moses was running around doing his thing and scripture says, And Joshua, son of Nun, never departed from the tabernacle day or night. It struck me a few years ago. I've been to that portion like five times and it's the first time I saw that person. The man God who was the man God was preparing to take over from Moses. His heart wasn't in the surroundings. His heart wasn't in the grumblings. His heart wasn't in the provision. His heart was where God was. What are you focusing on that is taking away from that? What are your plans instead of watching for God's plans? You've got to live. You've got to dream. You've got to be doing something. You've got to be focused. Sometimes the biggest test is to sit on your hands and don't move. In some places, these guys camp for a year. A year, standing in a big open desert, going, oh, it's the same mountains. Can we go now? 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 Oh, I saw something. No, wasn't it? 300 days of the same place, and there's no DSTV, there's no PSP, there's nothing there to keep you entertained. But there was a tabernacle. Why? Because maybe there was an army just across the mountain. Maybe there were bandits. Maybe there was a flesh flood. Really sitting here all by myself, feels like I'm not moving, I'm not crying, I'm not doing anything. Why don't you focus on where you need to be now? So when you learn and you grow about where you are, what's going on, you can move into the next phase of your life full and enjoy and with the right standing of God. Please, if you don't get anything else, hear that. Don't put yourself through it. Oh, it's enough. It's, it's tough enough when you do things that you don't really intend to do and you realize they're a mistake. But when you willingly run into a mistake and you justify it, it was like one of the first ones. It always struck me. For the sins I've committed without thinking. How many times do we choose not to think before we do something? If he is the king, if I belong to the kingdom, if his laws are for me and statutes for my good, why do I nullify that? Why do I think it's a good idea to do something, if this is for my good, and I do the opposite, I justify and I make it okay? How is that going to benefit me? How is that going to help me? How is that going to draw me closer to my God so I can spend time in His tabernacle? It's called a tent of meeting. Put up an eight foot wall with all your mistakes and then you will not be meeting. You'll be shouting over the wall going, are you still there? <laughs> and you wonder why your relationship is distorted. You wonder why you need young people. Because we don't think. Perspective. Guidance. What does God say about said things? What does my heart say? And why am I trying to overrule what God said by this? We do it all the time. It's because we sit in our fortifications. We forget to look up. We forget to look at the Creator. We forget to look at what He wants. What would bring Him glory? Because my heart is for Him. It should be for Him. If it's not, have a heart check. It's not about your life and why he should be in your life because you want him there. It's the other way around. It's I love him that much that I want to be in his heart and I want to be where he is. So help me get there, but he's going to have to teach me here so that I can get there. He will meet you in your living room. He will meet you in the sukkah. He will meet you in the tent out of the back if you follow his lead. If you don't, Click, click. Brick wall. Crying. I don't really understand why I ran into that wall. I mean, didn't think. We've got processes that we have to go through, guys. Alright.
There's something that I need to share with you before the kiddies come up. You would have heard me mention this last, last year at Sukkot. On the last day, Hoshana Rabbah, okay, that's what it's called, on the eighth day is the Holy Convocation, right? It is the time in Israel because obviously we're opposite, they're coming into their winter rains now, so they're going into their, their autumn, okay? So what happens is, in the biblical times, Yeshua and them used to go, and they used to go to the temple, and the high priest and his boy used to get like a gold pitcher, they used to walk all the way down through the city of David to the pools of Siloam, Shiloach, okay? Literally means the scent. Scoop up living water from the pool from the Gihon Spring. Remember, it was part of the Gihon that was funneled into the pools of Shalom. Go up the stairs and they would go to the altar of God and they would pull the water out and they would pray for rain. But there was an, a portion that they were being reminded of at the same time that pops in. I want you guys to turn to uh, Ezekiel 47. entrance of the house. The house is the temple. Okay, rabbinic writings were, were referred to the temple as the house. I saw water flowing eastward from under the threshold of the house, from under the seat, from the inner chambers in other words. So from the Holy of Holies, under the very throne of God, south of the altar, next he had me out to the north gate and took me to the outside of the outer gate by way of the east gate where I saw the water trickling from the south side. With a line in his hand, the man went out toward the east and measured a thousand cubits. And he made me wade across the stream. The water came up to my ankles. He measured another thousand cubits and he made me wade through the water which reached my knees. He measured another thousand cubits and he made me wade through the water up to my waist. Finally, he measured a thousand cubits and there was a river I couldn't cross on foot. Because the water was so deep, one would have to swim across. It was a river that could not be waded through. He asked me, human being, have you seen this? Then he guided me and he got me back onto the riverbank. After being returned, I saw on the bank of the river a great number of trees, on the one side and on the other. He said to me, the water flows toward the eastern region and continues down to the Arava, to the Dead Sea region. When it enters the sea, the sea of stagnant water, the Dead Sea, it's called dead because not even little microorganisms can live there. It is not just because of the salt density, it's because of the mineral composition. You, you know, it's, it's that bad that you have to tell people two days before, do not shave. I don't care if you've got a little bit of hairy legs. Trust me, you will enjoy the water more. It stings. I have had the misfortune of people seeing running into this beautiful, clear, blue lake. And you think, wow, that's life-giving, man. And then they run in and they dive in and then they come up and then they start screaming. Because <laughs> the water's in the eyes. And they literally have to be pulled out, taken to water, and they rinse their eyes for about two minutes solid just to get that out. It stings the life out of you. There's something like 33 trillion tons of minerals that they harvest out of that thing. Okay, that's why you float. Those pictures where you check the guy with the, with the newspaper floating across the thing, it's real. I've stood in, probably from here all the way down to the flat at the bottom, okay? I've seen it, it's that clear that you look down and you see the floor. Water holds you up like this. I bounce up and down to try and see how far I can go. The deepest I got was here. Okay, and it's ridiculous. Another thing that I find extremely funny was there was a lifeguard. I'm like, you better be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the point of this guy? Okay? Uh, maybe just to laugh at the tourists who dive in. Okay? I don't know, but he's there. It says, now that Dead Sea, its water will become fresh 
When this happens, the swarms of all kinds of living creatures will be able to live in it, wherever the streams flow, so that there will be a vast number of fish, and the fish is flowing there, so that wherever the river goes, everything will be restored and be able to live. The Dead Sea will bring life from living water that comes out the seat of God. Something dead comes to life. Resurrection. Okay? Now, this is something that they read. This is something that they understand. I want you to jump forward to John chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 37. John 7, the Gospel of John, chapter 37. Now on the last day of the festival, Hoshana Rabbah, this is the eighth day of the Holy Convocation, <coughs> Yeshua stood up and cried out, if anyone is thirsty, let him keep coming to me drinking. Whoever puts his trust in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from his innermost being. I am the water of Ezekiel 47. Now we said this about the spirit to whom he was trusted in him were to receive later the spirit that has not yet been given because Yeshua had not yet been glorified. The dead will come to life. He is that water in the midst of the celebration and he's going, you know that water you're pouring on the altar? I'm standing right here. You want life-giving water? You want things to be brought from dead, dry summer into life-giving crops and beautifulness and all exciting? You want the dead to be raised again? Here I am. You start to understand why Sukkot can be something so special, so beautiful, something so important for us. And we can celebrate it in its fullness because we know that Yeshua was our tabernacle, in a sense. Gate, altar, offering, labor, holy of holies. The very throne room of God, altar of incense, uh, the menorah, table of showbread, one, two, three, four pillars here, one, two, three, four, five pillars there. I'm the gate. No one comes to the Father but through me. I'm the sin offering, David Tone, the John Kippur. I'm there so you can go further. I wash you clean so that you can be cleansed. You come through me through the word of God, which is Torah, the five pillars of our foundation. You walk in and you see the seven spirits of God because you understand that, the menorah. You come in and you see the bread of His presence, the He is the bread of life. You come into the presence where your prayers get interceded by Yeshua Himself in the throne room of God. And you come through the four pillars, the yud hev all the four Gospels, into the throne room where you can go and have Communication with God on His throne. Where's your sukkah? He is that. That's the abridged version, guys. Go back to the study on Exodus 9 or 29 if you can look at the video. I'm going to show you pictures and I'll discuss the colors and I'll show you the differences between the gold, the bronze, and the silver. Everything is there is about relationship. He is our tabernacle. So that He can dwell in us. So that we can be that. We are the new temple of God, right? Aten, we. It's plural. For you. you know, do you not know that you are the new temple? The temple that was built up when they, when Aaron built up this temple, and it was built the, the retaining walls because the mountain was like this. And he said, no, 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 you can only build that temple. So what he did is he built up a couple of sections. He built up a wall, built up a wall, built up a wall, and he filled it. 
Now that platform, Temple Mount, where the Dome of Rock stand is 144,000 square meters, 11 football fields. And he puts a temple in the middle. Every stone that was pulled out had a number on a marking. Because on top of the retaining wall, we need foundations. We need stairs to go up through the retaining wall to the holder gates. We need the actual temple itself. We need the crown to go on top of it. We need the other piece that fits on top of that. We need the menorah that goes inside. We need the table of showbread. Everything was quarried and made for a specific purpose, for a specific place. Are you not a stone? Are you?